Good morning. We are so glad you have joined us again, and I hope that you continue to check in with us and see what if <laughs> it would get any more interesting as we go along. If it was dependent upon me, we have no hope. But Steve will lift this thing up out of the uh, depths of the sea. That's and pressure, man. Don't put that kind of pressure on me. <laughs> well, it is great for you to to visit with us again. My name is Mark Mitchell. I'm a preaching minister at the Park Avenue Church of Christ. And as always, I'm joined by Steve Fox, who has been a minister for almost 50 years in the Canal Valley. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing okay, but every week when you say that, it makes me feel a lot older. 50 years in the Canal Valley, yeah. Well, I could go with, he's been here a long time, if you want. <coughs> nah, I like the number better. Yeah, I figured you did. I mean, it's it in truth, it is an accomplishment. Yeah, and <clears throat> and you're still allowed me. to be here. Oh Can yeah, I... and, and it's such a compliment that sometimes you you want to hear it, but you feel real guilty because you're <laughs> so proud of it. You know. Well, yeah. Well. It, but it is humbling to it, know that. Yes. To know that I've <clears throat> gone that long and ruined that many people's lives. <laughs> Oh uh, well, no, I I can I can attest for the the fact that you didn't do that. Okay, now, thank you. You're my witness. I am your witness. I am your witness, indeed. Um, but it is a uh, it is a different time that we live in, though. I mean, with all of the things going on with uh, the world we live in. Uh, in fact, Kelly and I were. were joking yesterday, I said, I wonder how many people would like to have 12-31-2019 just do a reboot. Out of the way. Reboot it. Let's do this. Let's try this again. Mm. Because what a year. Well, towards the end of the year, we may be trying it again. Um, That's what some of the scholars say. Some of the scientists that know what they're talking about. Oh, the pandemic doing mm -hmm. I don't know who to believe anymore so I'm just I, I, quit. <laughs> I don't either I mean I, I start reading a newspaper article and I, and I get halfway through and go why am I reading this yeah and here's the thing it, it seems that um, nobody knows <coughs> without a shadow of a doubt which mm -hmm. is in, in a way reassuring uh, but in another way, it, it, it makes you feel like, okay, please, somebody explain to me what's going on. But it doesn't necessarily work that way. Uh, last week, we began a new topic, and we began talking about the kingdom. Uh, you wanna, would you like to sum up what you kind of... Where uh, we, last week? Yeah. Where we were? Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Um, we noted last week that we had studied some characteristics of Jesus, some characteristics that he had that he demonstrated to people in, in public in his three-year ministry and also, also in private. But we, we started with the Gospel of Luke and looked at how many times Luke said something about giving instructions or Jesus just saying things, maybe a parable, maybe, maybe a time frame where he said the kingdom is going to be here at a certain time. Mm -hmm. Not pinpointing it, but saying in the general area of time. And we notice that Jesus' mission, according to Luke, is in John, I mean, <laughs> according to Luke, is Luke um, 4, verse 43. Because Jesus had a, a mission in mind. His ministry ended with I mean, started with a mission. His mission started with uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist's message was exactly the same. Jesus' ministry started and ended with the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And in between, you've got all these other passages that relate to the definition of the kingdom or occurrences of the, king, of the kingdom in people's lives. And uh, 4.43 says this. When it was day, he departed and went into a lonely place. 
And the people sought him and came to him, and he would have kept him from leaving. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom. Okay, there's his mission. From, from the beginning of Luke to the last part of Luke. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I am sent for this purpose. Yeah. It's interesting to notice that Jesus said he had a purpose. A lot, a lot of us get caught up in um, ideas or what, what's, what's the main theme of your life. Jesus said, I need to go teach these other cities too. That was, that was his purpose. Mm -hmm. So what we studied last week was Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven belongs to those people who are poor in heart. Um, he also said that uh, we have a great privilege to be in the part of, to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And as you read through Luke, if you're reading this with us, um, Jesus refers to it as the kingdom of heaven as the kingdom of God. It's exactly the same thing. One's denoting where it came from, and one's denoting what what happens when we, we become part of the kingdom of God. We listen to God because it's his kingdom. And you noted last week that every kingdom has to have a king, a servants. A ser some servants, and some territory. Mm -hmm. Their domain. And that's true also in the kingdom of heaven. And you can look at that idea as you go through. Uh, and the last thing we studied last week was this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And Jesus said in in uh, nine twenty seven, <clears throat> excuse me, said in nine twenty seven. There's some of you who are standing here who would not taste of death until the kingdom comes. Kind of an addition to the prayer when Jesus said, "Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth, on earth as it is in heaven." And you don't have to walk around here too far to find out that it's not being done on earth. Not no, even, not even close. It's not. Yeah. Hold on. Well, this week we're going to begin in uh, Luke chapter 10 and take up there with uh, Luke chap chapter 10, and I'll be reading from verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. And additionally, chapter 11, verse 20. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I know that uh, it's almost, <laughs> it's not contradictory, but it's kind of polar ends. Jesus proclaims that to some of the Pharisees and some of the others, and actually to a lot of the population of Judea at the time that they could see miracles and they still wouldn't believe mm -hmm. but yet Jesus proclaims to those who are willing to listen that in your eyes this should tell you the kingdom of God is near that um, that the very fact that I'm doing these things should give you a signal as to what's going on, if you want to see it. Nicodemus said uh, in John chapter 3, <clears throat> we know that you are from above, because no, no man way. could do anything like you're doing. No. So that should have been a sign right there. That, but, you know, if you're going to deny somebody, you're going to deny somebody no matter what you see in front of you. Well, and, and given the case of Nicodemus, he would only see Jesus at nighttime for fear of his fellow Pharisees. Or, or maybe he worked during the night. <laughs> worked during the day. He worked during the uh, No, it actually says in John chapter 2. He came two, by night. He came, that he came by night for fear of the Pharisees. So, you know. Um, so, there are times in our lives that we're witnesses to certain things and we just don't see them either. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it is a uh, complicated <laughs> idea of who you attribute the things that happen here. Um, but Jesus says, in essence, pay attention to it anyway.
Mm -hmm. the, uh, the next one that you're supposed to discuss is um, Luke 16. 16, 16. And look, isn't this interesting? On our tablet, we have Mark 16, 16. <laughs> Which is a very interesting verse if you're not familiar with it. Yeah. You've got to read that. I mean, I don't mean you, I mean our audience. Uh, the law and the prophets were proclaimed unto John, until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least of the stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. I guess I would. I'm glad I gave you that one instead of me. Uh, yeah, that is almost just like um, a little. <laughs> it's like you're watching a TV show, and uh, right in the middle of the show, the, the commentator looks at you and says, and, "Oh, by the way, you know, now back to our show." Yeah. <laughs> that is almost what that is because parenthetical. The, yeah, the he's he's talking to the. Jesus has just done the parable of the shrewd manager, and uh, now we have this, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, since that time the good news of the kingdom is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. Uh, I might have to... Are you going to hit this one back to me? I, I, I might have to toss this one back to you. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I no, that's okay. The first thing you have to remember about this passage is John the Baptist speaks the same message when he came into the world that Jesus spoke. Mm -hmm. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's all the way through the Gospels. So John the Baptist is teaching exactly the same message that Jesus was going to teach a few months later, a few years later, when he comes into the world to do what he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I don't know if you ever thought about <coughs> Excuse me, I was not supposed to do that. I don't know if you ever thought about what they were going out to see, but this is what I envisioned in my mind. All these people going, you got to come out here and listen to this guy. You got to listen to him, man. He, he's something. He's given us information that we've never had before, mm -hmm. and he's telling us about future things that we didn't know about. You got to come out and see this guy. Well, when they got out there, they saw more than a preacher, I think the thing, closest thing you could, closest phrase you could use to describe was, John was a hippie. Mm -hmm. He had been very comfortable in 1962, 63. <laughs> he had taken a um, Nazarite vow. So just think of a guy who who's never. 30, who has never cut his hair. Yeah. And he, he's out there and he eats he has a strange, strange diet. He eats locusts and wild honey. And honey. That's it. And he's baptizing people in the river because because they are the ones who are thinking his message is correct. I'm going to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So you've got this weird character, almost like a animated character out there in the river baptizing people, and you've got all these crowds just flocking to him saying, you've got to come hear this guy. He's absolutely amazing. Now, Luke says, keeping the time thing in mind, Luke says in 1616, the law and the prophets were until John. The law, the hmm. old law, the Ten Commandments. The law and the prophets, there are a bunch of major prophets, there are a bunch of minor prophets. Those two things he separates. He says, those were until John. So there's some kind of transition between John and Jesus. And he says, they talked about the law and they talked about the prophets, but that was just up till John the Baptist. And now they're going to put their focus somewhere else. It's still the kingdom, but it's not, it's not this man. It's not. And a lot of people thought, you know, looking at John the Baptist, he was so different and so weird and so successful in his ministry, maybe he is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Maybe that. Maybe he is the one. And he kept telling him, nope, nope it's not me. Because I'm not worthy to tie this guy's shoes when he gets here. So in 1616, he says, since then, since John, 
The good news of the kingdom of God, there it is again, is preached and everyone enters it violently. Okay, now I'm going to hit it over the net back to you. and you. <laughs> no. Yeah, you're going to let me say to you what I think everyone is. What in the world does it mean to enter the kingdom of God violently? Uh, there are different meanings if you read different commentaries. The major one is it was not easy for these people to get in the kingdom of God. There was conflict, chaos, sometimes bloodshed, that some people had entered the kingdom of God in a violent way. Well, you know, how many times does Jesus actually use the uh, story narrative of a parable to describe the nature by which we as humanity have often taken control of everything, and we do it in such a way where we kill, murder, and destroy uh, things in order to overcome them. And I could see where, uh, and I'm not so sure that's exactly what's being completely said here. Well, there's not even a whole verse about it, just like a half. Yeah, it's just like phrase. a little snippet in here. It's like, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. back to you, Will, you know. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then he goes, giving to what you just bookending again, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, but then it says at the very end of that, but not a least stroke of the pen to be dropped out of the law. So uh, you want to talk about your basic confusion, someone? Luke just, <laughs> this is the moment where you take the mic and you drop it. Well, That's you, it. I missed you. Or you give it to somebody else. What? Or you give it to somebody else. Yeah. Well, look at all the, like the Crusades. You know, people were well intentioned on the cruci when they fought the cru Crusades because they wanted people to become a part of the kingdom of God. Well, that's a weird way of doing it. You know, you put a sword up to somebody's chest and say, "Are you interested in hearing about Jesus?" <laughs> that's a weird way to do it. Then. That kind of violence has been there all the way down through time. Catholics and Irish, the Catholics and the Irish people killed each other for decades. Well, shoot. And both of them supposedly fighting for the same thing. Yeah, uh, well, the entire uh, Middle Ages was, uh, as I've said different times, I mean, you go into most <coughs> European <coughs> churches. And they actually tell the story of battles that they have fought. That where did the knights come from? The knights come from religious wars. They did. They were not started mm -hmm. by kingdoms that man had made. They were started by kingdoms that God had made. And then these men came in and forcibly tried to force things. Which and we talked last week about the difference between the kingdom that Jesus was bringing to the earth mm -hmm. and the other kingdoms all around it. Yeah. All those, some of them had very, very good characteristics, but it wasn't the kingdom of God. No. It wasn't the kingdom of heaven. Well, you know, sometimes I think that's what goes on in, in the country that we live in. We have some great ideas behind our nation, our uh, republic. But we're still not the kingdom of God. We're still a man-made or and a man-ran institution, we, we all get together and decide for ourselves what's good, better, and best, and what's bad, and what's worse, and, you know, we give all these clarifications. And part of that badness, part of that chaos, comes from the fact that religion, all the way down through history, had some, uh, had different ideas. Religious people and scientists were, had different ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Galileo was the first one to say, "You know, I, I don't think we're, I don't think that the sun's moving around us. I think we're moving around the sun." And he was claimed a heretic. And they said, "Well, what's the matter with you? You're mad." And they killed him. Yeah. For that one reason. He, yep. Because he was right about the Earth traveling around the, traveling around the sun. So you yeah. got all kinds of chaos and and trouble. And some people with the greatest intentions have the greatest good intentions. And you still got chaos. 
in trouble. It actually goes back to what you said when when we talked about the four things you need <coughs> in order to have a church, and it still yet is just as true, and it's more, not necessarily more true, but it's as true as in this kingdom is we're not in charge. We don't decide what's what is right, what is wrong. All we can do is take what uh, is given to us and do the best we can with it. And you know what, Mark? We don't like that. No, we don't. We want to be in control. We want to decide. But we don't make the rules. We don't make the regulations in, in this kingdom. We might no. make some decisions about other kingdoms. Yeah. But in this kingdom, we don't make the rules and the regulations. We try to listen to the authority of one man. Yeah. And <coughs> I hope how soon that... Um, as we learn and as we grow in our maturity that um, James is one of my favorite books to read and it's, it is so loaded with the wisdom of a man who's just transitioned from self-proclaimed religion of being a Jew and then now gone being Jesus' brother and going now to being, and also probably the elder bishop or whatever he, of the church in Jerusalem. And he, his wisdom is so profound that he actually begins with, with, okay, quick to listen, slow to speak. And we are, me especially, oh, yeah. quick you, to speak. You especially. Oh, to, no, I, I've never done that. Quick to speak, I'm more likely to be slow to listen, if ever. So, you know. Uh, none to listen. None to listen. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. I had a, well, I have a real good friend who used to be a, an eye doctor here in, in Charleston. And uh, we were eating lunch one day and he started talking about, he put these two or three verses together and, and I saw where he was going with it and I said, do you know that many paragraphs? And he said, oh yeah. I said, I, I memorized the book of James. And I said, you memorized it? And he said, yeah, I had five brothers and sisters and we'd get in a fight. My mom would make me go in my bedroom and I had to read the whole book of James. <laughs> <laughs> of said, all the books you wanted, that, that's, that's a that good one. Didn't take me long until I knew it pretty well. I had a whole thing memorized. Actually, I think James is almost like the... <clears throat> The Christian version of Proverbs. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's loaded with sound advice. And like I said, that one, I, I almost need to have that one tattooed on me somewhere, on my eyeballs, where my glasses on the inside of them say, quick to listen, slow to speak. Are we done with John the Baptist? I think we, we're, okay. we're ready to move on to. Matter of fact, you got to remember as we close this out about John the Baptist. Jesus said there's no man greater like that ever came from a woman's womb I know. than John. I know. Um, the next passage we were going to look at, we have time to look for one more. Oh, yeah. Okay. Chapter 17, beginning with verse 20. In the <clears throat> This is one of those I should hit, hit the ball back to Mark, but I'm going to take a shot at it anyway. Chapter 17. <clears throat> verse 20 being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming boy he set you up really good right here <laughs> really <laughs> really it's coming and they want to know when yeah. we know it's close if you say you're the Messiah and you say you're going to set up the kingdom of God when's it going to be yeah a very it's very a legitimate question legitimate question I was thinking of the same word you thought of that's kind of scary uh -oh. Asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, he an here's his answer. The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, lo, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. The phrase we're going to look at is the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Biblical scholars, and by the way, I'm not one of them. But biblical scholars have two ideas about this, this phrase, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He's either saying, 
I'm here in the middle of you and you're kind of surrounding me and I am the essence of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven and I am right in the middle of you. Or if you look at the footnote in the, in the real Bible, the Revised Standard Version, the footnote says the kingdom of God is within you. So it's something that is inside me as was promised later by Peter and Paul and other New Testament writers that the Spirit would be inside you. The Spirit would indwell in you. And a lot of people say, well, especially those who are opposed to this belief, they say, well, you can't explain how the Spirit of God dwells in you. Well, you know what? I can't explain how my own spirit dwells in me. I just know that when it goes out of my body, I'm going to die. Well, actually, you're going to have a great deal of the population today who would argue with you that you do not have the Spirit, that you're just pure carbon, and when you die, you just go back to the ground. There's nothing that passes on. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is a complicated subject. And I think it could be both things. It could be he was standing in the middle of them, mm -hmm. and he was also promising that the kingdom of God would be in, inside them that wherever you walked around, there would be the kingdom of God. Well, also in John chapter 14, Jesus says the Spirit will be in you and around you. So it mm -hmm. very well could be, uh, as a context, both at the same, given at the same time, much like uh, the Hebrew writer. Paul. <laughs> uh, said that everything is held together like glue through God. Meaning that God's everywhere anyway, much like what David said. You know, I can go anywhere. There you are. Jonah found that out too. Yeah, Jonah found it out. He was even in, inside <laughs> of a big fish. Well, to those who get offended. Uh, but, you know, this idea of and I know we're kind of like trying, maybe dotting some I, crossing some T's concept, because there has been a, for the last, I don't know, 100 years at least, this uh, idea of kingdom has kind of been twisted around where there was a there was thought that goes around that we don't actually have the kingdom. We're waiting for it. We're waiting for it. And I... I understand a little bit of that logic behind that statement because like we start out with, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you look around the planet today, if you look around the earth look today, like, it doesn't look like the, the there's kingdom, kingdom has of God's come. Here, yeah. But there's also a process where maybe you have kingdom passages all the way through the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because we talked about a king has to have servants. Uh, God had servants in the Old Testament. He had a bunch of servants in the Old Testament. So, was that a part of the kingdom? I mean, when Adam and Eve were obeying God, were they a part of the kingdom? Were they God's servants? So it's all the way through the Old Testament. It's especially all the way through the New Testament where servants are talk, talked about in the kingdom. We, well, you know, given given the idea of uh, when God tells Isaiah, through Isaiah and. Hosea and several of the, of the prophets before uh, Jerusalem, Judea is taken off into bondage. He, he tells them, you know, if I stay with you, I'm saying that everything you're doing is right. You're forcing me to leave you. Mm -hmm. And in essence, was even in their worst circumstances, were they still the kingdom of God, representative of God in this world? Yes, they were. In 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses his letter to the church. To the church, and man, from from chapter one to the end of the book, he calls them brothers. Trouble after trouble, after problems after pro misunderstanding, misunderstanding. And he still calls them the church. They're still his brothers and sisters. Still brothers and sisters in Christ. So, if if we're looking for uh, for the behavior to signify to signal that the kingdom of God is here, that's not the thing that Jesus brings up Jesus says that you know in this it's not something that you can say oh here it is I can't point at it you can't point at it um, and it, evidently it's possible for it to be here 
and you don't even know it. Well, that's what makes the spirit world so interesting. <laughs> when when uh, when somebody's baptized, if they're baptized into Christ according to Scripture and the New Testament, Zoom. they're a part of the kingdom of God. You can't see that. No. You can't see forgiveness of sins. You can't see repentance. You, you can't see the <clears throat> abolition of their sins. You can't. The guy looks the same, and the girl looks the same when you put them under, as when you bring them back up. So there's certain things in the spirit world that can happen that we can't even see. And so that, the, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God have a lot of characteristics like that. There are things that are happening maybe that you cannot see with your physical eyes. No. And uh, what is it? Uh, again, going back to Hebrews, this uh, crowd of witnesses that's possible of the spiritual realm that we don't even, I mean, we're never going to see, but maybe when we pass, we become part of this crowd of witnesses. They circle you. Uh, so there is a, again, we, we tend to always use these eyes, these ears, this, this reality, the physical reality, the one that's going to be done away with, uh, as, our, as our pattern or design for what we're looking for in a kingdom. And it's the last thing in the world that would ever represent a kingdom. Because it's us. Mm -hmm. I mean, God. God's a. He's a spirit, and as Jesus put it, those who want to worship Him do what? Worship in the spirit and truth. That's right. And that's why I think uh, a lot of people. We we should never be satisfied with what's going on down here on earth, even when we're in the kingdom. That's right. But at the same time, we also ought to understand that God is gracious and God is forgiving, and God knows that. We're not perfect, so he's going to offer us forgiveness. But that comes only through the kingdom of God. That comes only through the kingdom of Christ because that's where that promise came from. You can't go to Germany or Switzerland or Italy or New Zealand and say, hey, I'm, I'm here to receive my forgiveness of sins. Yeah. That's it, not the kingdom that can offer it. Yeah, you're, how, how is it in Citizenship is the expression that Paul uses a couple different times. Um, yeah, in Ephesians. That uh, as a ambassador or to the kingdom of God. We're a nation too. Peter calls us a holy nation. A holy nation. A holy priesthood. I mean, you know, we're all these various d terms which denote uh, a collective group and to be separate from the rest of the world, but yet. To be in, to be an assistant and in influence of the rest of the world. I mean, it is this much like all the things that we try to uh, grow in our maturity and and our understanding in. They all boil down to us allowing ourselves to be drawn closer to an idea of Jesus, as opposed to the idea of the world that keeps trying to influence us on. Uh, and that is where. Our struggle is every day. Am I looking at life as part of God's kingdom? Or am I looking at this world? That's how I want to live. But you have to remember you can't see everything. Yeah. Uh, there was a lady at church last Sunday came up to me and said, Have you read uh, This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti? And I said, I've read it twice. She said, Is that an amazing book? I said, Yes, it is. If you're interested in reading a novel about what you and I just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a novel about what's going on up around there and what's, the what's being said in nether the region. nether regions. Yeah. Okay, i got to send this angel down there because Steve needs help, kind of like It's a Wonderful Life. You know? yeah. And uh, another lady from our church suggested it to me. And I, I was you know, reading five or six other books. I said, I don't have time to read that. I read the first five pages, and I'm walking around the house eating, I'm sitting down, going to my bedroom, <laughs> turning the light on. I just, I couldn't put it down. You know, it's one of the best books I've ever read, especially if you want to read about spiritual warfare and, and what maybe is going on around us mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah, we are and definitely... You can't see that. No, you can't see it, and most of the time as... Uh, 
think Joe Bean put it in his book in the spiritual realm. Uh, uh, most of the time what happens is about the time we realize we're in a battle, we're already defeated. And we didn't see the snares. We didn't see that. We didn't see the the things because we weren't looking for them. We're walking around, as he put it, sometimes so blind. It's scary to think about how many traps there are. Oh, we all got traps all around us all the time. All the time. All the time. I mean, um, one of my and portions of every one of my prayers who is. Who knows how the spirit world helps us when we deal with those? Oh. Um, well, I was going to say, one of my parts of my prayer that I constantly play, pray is, Lord, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a mind to understand. Because I'm pretty hard-headed, <laughs> I'm pretty blind, and I'm deaf half the time, Father. So if you don't scream at me, I, I might not hear you. Yeah. Well, if you... I think we're, we're, if you're going to hit the ball back to me, I think we're probably at the end of our time here, buddy. I hate to say this to, unless you got no, a I'll low just, point. No, I was just going to say, we so far we've studied Jesus' mission that the poor and hard are part of that kingdom. We are privileged to be a part of that kingdom. That generation had something special and different about them. The miracles, John the Baptist, the spiritual side of of being a part of the kingdom. And next week we'll study three or four other concepts of the kingdom. Yeah. Um, and then what we hope to continue to do is maybe even a little bit further on kingdom, but speak to characteristics of the kingdom. We may take a look at what, what should the kingdom look like as far as the people in it, the behavior of those individuals. If you want to make a great study about the kingdom of God. Isaiah 2, yep. Joel 2, Acts 2, <laughs> and I missed one in here somewhere. Isaiah 2, Joel 2, Acts 2, and I'll tell you next week what the other one is. There's hey. another chapter 2 that fits into that category. Okay. Alright. Now can you take this out because I don't want to shatter the idealism and think people think about me that I was wrong about something. You can cut that out, can't you? What's that? <laughs> no. Not I, leaving I, don't, I don't want Susie to see that I made a mistake. <laughs> uh, she already knows. Oh, she already Okay. Forget it then. Well, we enjoyed you spending your time with us, and I hope you enjoyed us being with you. That would probably be the better question. But as in the coming weeks, we continue to have our discussions. If there's anything that we can do, anything that we can say, or any discussion you would like to have, for us to have, please don't hesitate to give us a call or let us know. You can email me at mark.mitchell at parkavcoc.org or contact me at 304-343, I forget the last four digits, uh, doesn't come with signs. Can't say here it is. Oh my goodness. You're not going to cut that out. Yeah, I am. Okay, when you put this in here, there's one thing that I wrote down here and I forgot. Um, last Saturday, Mark and Jerry and I had a wedding and we married a couple. Great couple. And I just wanted to use this opportunity to say to to Matt and to Morgan, that we wish them the best. We wish them long, long life, long, long married life where they have very few problems and troubles in their life. And the only reason I wanted to mention that was they told me right after the wedding Saturday that I was invited to their 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. Methuselah, are you? <laughs> Not, not even close. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> well, again, we thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week. And God bless. Have a great week. Thank you.